Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, and today we are sitting down with Calgary mayoral candidate Jan Damery. Jan, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I'm thrilled to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me. Jan, I start all my interviews off with the same question, so you're no exception to this. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from? It comes from my family, my uh, maternal grandfather in particular, Papa Taylor. Um, uh, he was uh, dedicated to service, uh, was dragging me out to uh, community events and political organizing events uh, when I was, uh, you know, just a, a girl. And um, so has, has long been this sense of needing to serve and, uh, and I so believe in people. Um, and so I think that's just been a bit of the red thread through my career. Now, you can give back in many different ways through nonprofit organizations, through politics. In 2021, you have decided that this is the time for you. This is the time that you have decided to put your name forward for po political office in the realm of municipal politics and Calgary's mayor. Why now? What is it about 2021 that gave you hope that you would be elected? And if you are elected, you could change the attitude and atmosphere at City Hall. Yeah, it's, I truly believe in crisis, there is always opportunity for a new path forward. And I find that people are more open to change. Um, I'm also seeing in the current municipal landscape, uh, just a real lack of leadership. And I, I happen to possess skills. Uh, it's almost like my whole career has brought me to this point, Chris, uh, because I've learned to lead with influence. I've learned to lead through people and pulling people together. And never now is there a time when we need that kind of quality in our leader, and particularly the mayor, uh, who I view as sort of almost the chair of council and that really has the responsibility of facilitating just a really strong, high performing team in service of uh, Calgarians. Um, the other reason why now is why not? <laughs> And because I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I've always committed to action. I'm, um, you know, I think I, I take great pride in uh, people who know me know that uh, I do what I say, and uh, and I can't sit on the sidelines and complain uh, if I myself am not willing to put my hat in the arena. So that is why now. You mentioned a few things there that I want to dive into before we do start talking about a little bit of policy and leadership. And that's the one thing I want to focus on here, because as mayor, you are going to have to lead a group of potentially 10 new councillors and some returning ones, if everyone who's re uh, running for re-elections gets uh, re-elected, into a new unknown that Calgary has not seen. How do you envision your leadership style being a benefit during these uncertain times with COVID-19, with the uh, economic downturn, how do you envision and how do you believe your leadership benefits Calgary? Yeah, my leadership, and we've talked a little bit about this ability to lead with it through influence, knowing that also mayor is one vote on council. I actually see that we have a brand, a bunch of new councillors. It's one of the reasons even on my campaign, if you start to look at it, um, we are the only candidate has very detailed plans and ideas that we're already developing. Um, and it's about building a playbook. Uh, and I'm, I'm relational. Um, uh, I get to know people. It's a, the foundation is trust building. Uh, and I embrace diversity of opinion because I'm always curious why people think differently than I. And I love when I learn something and my mind has changed. So uh, let's be clear, I have opinions. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and I've had many, many experiences that kind of inform sort of how I tackle situations, but I think I am uniquely positioned to pull this new council together and already doing the work to do that by both building relationships and having a solid game plan that we can actually coalesce around. So that's why I think my leadership is needed, what I am doing differently than any of the other councillors and other candidates that are running for mayor. One of the big challenges that this uh, next four years is going to be for the next council and next mayor is how do we recover as a people, as a group, and not leave anyone behind? When you're door knocking, when you're out talking to people, what are they talk telling you about what they need from the next council? Because let's be honest, any candidate should be out door knocking, should be talking to people. So what are you hearing from them when it comes to the recovery of our city? 
Yeah. And it's very much on people's minds. They're looking for a reason to hope and believe, almost kind of believe in ourselves again, find that kind of wonderful spirit that we have as Calgarians. So they're looking for a bit of a lightning rod. And the best way that I know to do that is to actually talk about ideas. And uh, one of the pillars of my platform is leaving no Calgary behind in this recovery. It's about really in, inviting and, and investing in local economy. Um, we talk about being business friendly, but in the actuality, we are not as a city. We have a lot of hoops and rules that I also worry get in the way of a lot of our, what I'll call economic newcomers who are coming here to build a life, to raise their families, making tremendous sacrifice to do that. And they, by nature, are entrepreneurial, and we get in the way and, and make it very difficult for them to meaningfully participate in this economy. I have that lens also because I've been a leader in the last five years. I have a diverse career, as you know, but in the last five years, I've been working, I'm vice president of YWCA Calgary, so working with some of our most vulnerable in the city and understanding and through the eyes of our clients have gotten a sense of the barriers that get in their way. And I want to be that mayor, that that leader, that mayor that actually gets the barriers out of the way so that people can thrive, be creative. And we create a very vibrant local economy, which I believe is the solution to diversifying. Um, we often look to replace a monolithic oil and gas. Oil and gas is not going anywhere. I come out of that industry. It's not gonna be a big employer in terms of growth going forward, um, but it's a tech play now as most industries are. So how do we also help people get the skills and apply their skills and expertise? that they also have autonomy and are learning and creating this sense of mastery and contribution to this economy that we're trying to recover. So I think the city has a huge role to play to kickstart that, but also create safe spaces and open spaces that people wanna to come together and gather and be connected. So this is what I talk about, really embracing the diversity of this city um, and that we actually have common places uh, safe spaces that people want to be, where people feel that they're they're seen and heard and they're safe. It's a lot of the vision that I'm talking about. Now, I want to follow up on a question, a statement that you just made there. The boundaries that are in place currently. What are you hearing about those boundaries? What are those boundaries that are making it hard for people to open up businesses? Because uh, as someone who has not gone through the process of trying to open up a business, I don't know. And I think the majority of people would not know because they are employed and they are not trying to start a business. So from your perspective, talk to the business owners and say, these are the boundaries that I know that are in place that we need to take down. Yeah, and so much of it is, is the uncertainty in the permitting process. And if you also need a change in land use, you actually typically have to go to council, which creates a bunch of uncertainty and timelines, which is a killer for startup, but any business has been suffering. So we have to make that process more transparent, the rules more clear, and so that you have greater certainty when you actually embark in that process that you're actually gonna get the approval that you seek in a timeline that actually makes sense for you. It can take months, Chris, and that's a killer for business. I know this as an economist. Um, so want to get rid of those. And we've had kind of layers upon layers of these regulations, very specific kind of uses that you need. You know, I mean, if you're going to open a cyber, you know, an internet cafe, you don't need permitting. But if you're actually going to increase or, you know, run a restaurant, you're, you do need permitting. If you want to expand your restaurant, you actually have to go to city council to get a change of land use. It is so crazy. We just need to simplify this process and make sure that also our city employees, who I think are dealing with all of these confusing regulations and processes, that they actually have clear sign us, go on a site to serve businesses to make it easier to do business. Now, one of the things when I talk to Calgarians from here in Ward 10 to across the city is a little bit on what you just said, that they go to City Hall and they get lost. They get lost in the shuffle of this and this person has to deal with this permit. This person has to deal with this permit. And it is not an easy fix. As someone who comes from city administration, it is not an easy fix because it's not going to happen on day one of your uh, first term, but it is going to have to be something that you work towards. How do you ensure that, how do you talk to residents and say, if elected, I will smooth out the processes to make sure that city hall works for you and you're not getting lost in the shuffle. You're not getting lost at city hall because people have just given up hope. And I've hear this time and time again, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than having to deal with city hall anymore. I'll do it. And then I'll ask for forgiveness. How do you talk to those people? Yeah. And, and I'm hearing the same thing as we're, as we're door knocking. 
Um, and it is about always, it comes back fundamental to how we actually get along with people. And so when we think about also the relationship between city council and city administration, that needs to be a really strong relationship. And we actually have to respect the expertise that is in the city and also the direction that comes from council to get out of the weeds a lot. I think we've seen a lot of that in the last 10 years, way in the weeds. That to me is not proper governance. Um, and so we, the city of Calgary is a four and a half billion dollar enterprise. I think if people understand also complex, but it's a question of at, at, from a leadership perspective and a governance perspective is working with the city manager and his team, having those open conversations. This is the direction and let's talk about it and let's have some accountability about we, what, this is our objective, but let's also, what is the full circle and the feedback loop? Are we making progress? And the best way to know you're making progress is it gets easier for the people you're talking about when they go through City Hall and they actually want to come because they're going to try again because there's a bit of belief. Um, but it's about not setting direction and just letting it go. It's about actually staying on it and it's the accountability. It's also looking at streamlining. And I know that the current city manager has been doing some great reorganizing, trying to streamline and simplify. Uh, we, you always have to do that in bureaucracy. Um, I started my career working for the Alberta Department of Energy. And what you see over time is layers upon layers get built. And you have to have the courage to basically say, stop. Are we actually getting in the way of the things we are intending? And I think we've really reached that precipice point now. Uh, and it's about calling it. And we're actually going to simplify, get out of the way, take it away. We're going to treat people like adults and let them conduct their lives and their business accordingly. Um while we can talk about the city hall for probably about like a good two hours, because it is a topic that I think a lot of people want, I want to be cautious of time. I want to ask you the question that I've asked all mayoral candidates. What exactly are you hearing at the door? We can talk about city hall, but what exactly are the issues that are facing Calgarians that you're hearing from? Because I want to make sure that people know that you're listening to people because that's, what's going to make a great mayor listening, listening, listening. So what are you yeah. hearing? And it's a and it is a gamut. When I started this race, <laughs> I've got some real experts around the team and said, you know, you're going to have to be through this journey conversant, like on a thousand issues. And I said, oh, forgot that can't be. Cool. It's yeah, no, like it ranges from can you help me stop my neighbor from feeding the squirrels? So basic stuff like that, annoyances. To what do you mean about a tech school? How do we actually? The, the, the skill gap and how do we actually you know graduate more tech or how do I actually help my kid um, I'm worried that they're leaving the city because they see no opportunity and uh, you may have heard that I have a personal story along that front our 24 year old left the city last August because he could not find a job in Calgary and did not see a future he's gone to Victoria uh, my fear he's also met a local girl there I'm not sure we're going to get him back and I want to be a grandmother institute so it's about and this is so it is personal for me about Cree and I'm hearing about that I'm I'm hearing the story at the doors as well I'm worried my kids are going away they don't want to be a part of this city they also don't like the value set we are one of the most diverse cities on paper and we don't act that way so this is also what I'm committed and because of my experience in all sectors Chris I believe I have that unique lens that I can actually start to ask the question and and out of the gate I always ask whose perspective are we missing when we're trying to solve these issues and so back to your specific question, right? It's the gamut that I'm hearing at the door. Um, but ultimately it's about, and I think what unifies us is I wanna see opportunity for my kids. I wanna see them, uh, I wanna see opportunity for me, for younger families where it's getting tough. Can we ensure that I can actually have affordable housing? Uh, I'm concerned about wanting, I'm concerned about carbon um, emissions. I'm concerned about climate change. I don't see the city doing anything. I think we can do better. In fact, I just announced a carbon um, uh, management system um, out of the gate that is about action and meeting our, our carbon targets and also incentives that we actually go more green that creates jobs. I'm very excited about that. And getting some very good responses, even from the experts, that this has potential. So current, worried about public transportation. Can we have a city where we have options? And I'm worried about my personal safety walking the streets. This is something that is heartbreaking to me. We have racialized women in this city uh, walking around with bear spray. Like, just think about that for a minute, Chris. They're afraid because they're gonna be attacked on the street. 
that is not the Calgary I believe in. And I don't believe that is the Calgary that we are, but these things are happening and we have to actually have a reckoning about that. And so there is a huge role for the mayor to play, to have that lens, because if we make our streets safe for everyone, we come together, we feel connected and we don't feel alienated from each other. So it's about really driving that and pulling people together. And I know how to do that. That's why I'm offering my leadership at this time. Now, the great thing about this show is I take my direction from you. I literally bring no notes into this. I read your platform and that's about it. I bring no notes into this because I want you to drive the conversation. And you've just talked about three issues that have come up time and time again, while whether it be talking to mayoral candidates or even ward candidates, because I want to try and make sure that those voices are heard too. Uh, Whether that be transit and personal safety, but also retention of our residents. These are three things that are potentially going to be a big obstacle for the next council. I want to start with retention and attraction of new residents because you, you hit, you hit the hammer on the head. Your son has left. You know that he is probably not going to be coming back because he's met a girl. I see time and time again, for sale signs going up on my street in my area all the time. I talk to my neighbors and I say, why are you leaving? I'm not getting good service for my tax dollars. I do not believe that the city is growing. I can't find jobs. How are you as mayor going to change the narrative to ensure that the people who are here get that opportunity to find a job, to keep here, to ensure that their tax dollars are being used uh, for good services in the area, but also attracting new residents to say, hey, we're open for business. We want people here. We are a great diverse community and we want people to come here. I know that's a double-edged question, but I want you to answer it because it's a great topic that we want to talk about. It's fundamental. And uh, so very specific ideas in the platform uh, really to address that. And it's all about revitalizing our city. A part of that too is making sure we've got a vital core. So it's making downtown um, a neighborhood not just a place for business. So I don't think the answer is refilling all of those buildings just with new workers, which is a a big push on a lot of the strategies that is going on right now. We are floating an idea, a Calgary made in tech campus, working with all of our players in this market to really grow this ecosystem. But we get 4,000 plus students living and learning downtown. That then fuels local economy downtown We've not invested in the streetscape downtown. We have one walkable city. I love the idea of a 15 minute city um, where you can walk and bike to anything that you need. So you need amenity. And so ensuring that we also, from a city council and a mayor perspective, that we're signal boosting that, right? This is what's important as we develop, making sure that amenities are there that actually attract people, that we bring the cool back to Calgary. And this is what I'm hearing from the younger workforce, And also when we're talking to other companies who want to relocate to this city because they're attracting the young tech sort of skill set, they want a cool place that they can hang out. And they look at our downtown. I don't know if you've been there lately, Chris. It's a ghost town. And that's not just happened in the last year. That's been going on and happening for a long time. So we have to switch that model. Um, And so have very specific ideas and figured out a way to provide some startup capital to repurpose some of that space to drive that and assist. And again, get the rules out of the way that people can be creative and create and be creative about using that existing space. And I want to really amp and focus on that. Part of that is also, as we've talked about accessibility and transit, which I think is also important. Uh, And it speaks to safety too, because something I know to be true Um, I think, as you know, I've traveled and worked outside globally around some places. You feel safe on a street when there is lots of people around the street. It is when people are connected and they feel and see each other, um, safety concerns go down. It's when isolation, things are empty, things are not happening is when you actually see safety concerns. And so ensuring too that we're developing and both the core and also other neighborhoods. So when we think about our transit stations to make it safer for people, is that we've got lots of economy going on, that we're actually siting stations on some of these new lines, that we've got local businesses. You can pick up your groceries, right, from a local proprietor. That to me has been the gift of COVID and how important local economy is. And I was one too that was not investing in the local proprietor. And a bit of that mindset, I'm gonna pay a little bit more if I can support someone local, but it's worth it. Because it's about paying it forward and it creates um, uh, a multiplier effect in our economy. Uh, I'm an economist. My favorite concept is the multiplier. 
effect, right? So people are paid well, they see opportunity, their business is strong, they're hiring people, you get this virtuous circle that just generates economy. To me, that's the solution out of the boom bust for us. And, uh, and it's not rocket science. And I, I wanna just jump on that for a second because Calgary is not in a unique position. This pandemic has affected every area, every municipality, every business. We are not in a unique position here. How do you how do you change the narrative when the narrative has to be changed in all municipalities and everyone else is trying to attract the same residents and people are trying to attract residents from Calgary to move to their city and we're trying to attract them? How do you change that narrative at City Hall to ensure that we are that diverse, welcoming, open community that has all those amenities and has all those opportunities for everyone? And so much of it, I think, Chris, is realizing that we do have these assets. Like, um, we've got... We've got some of the best natural geographer anywhere in the world, right? How do we access that? But how do we access that without creating added congestion? We've seen the challenges there, right? And so um, starting, we're really starting to champion, right? That train idea from the airport through down, down, out to the Bow Valley, um, which just, it pushes us into this tier one kind of convention that actually allows us people to be in Calgary. Um, the rivers in this city, are phenomenal, the park systems. People also, the affordability relative to other cities in Canada, we still have the opportunity to be that affordable place. Um, I've talked to families who have actually come from outside of the country are coming to Calgary because they see that. I think sometimes we don't see it ourselves because we're coming off a very high and we think that things are awful, but it's appreciating that we actually have all we need. I've also been coaching um, startup tech companies uh, in our ecosystem locally uh, that companies are starting to scale. And I think that we've not shone enough light on all the good that is going on and the green shoots that are coming up in business. And it is so diverse. Tech is not a monolithic industry. It touches everything. And we have the ability to really highlight that, that creates and generates. But so much of it is ensuring, and this is where the city plays and why I wanna be that big booster for the city as mayor, is about believing in this amazing quality of life that we have that attracts more people, that creates opportunity, because we're also gonna be focusing investing in local economy. That's the way we get out of this. And it's about arts and entertainment. We've typically seen it as it's nice to have when things are good, and then we kind of pull back when things are bad. Arts pull people together, it's healing. We have such a vibrant arts community that has really suffered through COVID. And so part of my platform too is to kickstart a lot of that invention because that's where the vibrancy and art pulls people together. That actually builds the inclusive. People can say, I, you know, I feel a part of this. I want to create this. And it's eclectic and it's cool. So again, I want to be that mayor that brings the school back to Calgary and attracts people. I think the arts community would love to hear that. I think uh, I think there's a lot of people who would say local art matters and uh with the big blue ring that we have, which is not local, 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 uh, I think that rallied a lot of people to say, hey, why are we not promoting our local talent over some German company or German artist? So that's here nor there. Bingo. Bingo. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about safety. Um, I moved to the city two years ago, uh, almost three years ago. I, I love the city. Uh, well, originally from Slave Lake, but I moved from uh, Ontario originally. Uh, I I did my research. I think a lot of people, before they move to the community, they do their research. There is a narrative in the city of Calgary that drug, is, drug use is on the rise, crime is on the rise, gangs are an issue right now, shootings. We've had an officer killed in the last year and a half because of a, a hit and run. There is a narrative that the city is unsafe. You just you talked about it briefly that people don't feel safe. We, are, we have women who are carrying around bear spray because they do not feel safe to walk alone by themselves at night. How do we change the narrative and how do we change that so everyone feels safe? Because there is a movement right now, and I'm just I'm playing devil's advocate. There's a movement that we need to defund the police. We need to reduce their resources. So how do you make people safe, but also ensure that the police force is working for us and not being quote unquote corrupt. And I'm not saying they are, don't quote no. me on that. I'm just saying that that is the narrative that is out and I don't, And I don't buy into that at all, Chris, because I've worked in partnership with the police, certainly in the, in the realm of domestic violence with my work at YWCA. 
So how I make sense of all of this and what's happening is uh, COVID has shown us how vulnerable we all are and has really impacted all of our mental health. We're not as resilient and strong as we think we are, right? This has been a profound change and shift. And I have seen an openness to people to appreciate because usually we said those people that are mentally ill, we're gonna put them over here. And we've realized that this is a spectrum and touches all of us. So when we think about drugs and we think about safe injection sites, which I'm pro by the way, and we can get into that if you like too, is uh, we're not appreciating that people are in pain, they're suffering and they're acting out. So when you see a lot of that violence, a lot of the anger, uh, coping with drugs, these are pain points and this is about trauma. This is something we do not talk um, seriously about. And uh, so with my lens coming out of YWCA and what we were seeing and talking with other um, sort of agencies serving in our, in our city, we are very concerned coming out of COVID about what we're calling the shadow pandemic, which is very much about mental health, which is why I think you're seeing tons of bad behavior, which then get the lightning rod and this is not a safe space. And it's all about feeling included, but that we've actually got the resources uh, so I want to be a big champion for the work that it has been done, certainly in championed by our current mayor around mental health. And I, I, I get that because I've been working in a frontline agency for, for, DD for the last five years. And we need to pay attention to this and make sure we've got the right resources and the right expertise. So on the issue of police defunding, we have to get rid of that language. This is always, and the police would also say the same thing in my conversations with them is both from the grassroots to, to the executive leadership. We need the right expertise at the door. So if there is a mental health concern, we right now, it's the only option we're sending out for the most part police. They're not skilled to deal with those issues. Uh, we need to actually activate and empower our community and more serious partnerships to bring the expertise in mental health, social workers who are responding to those calls because they can deescalate and they can actually address it with the expertise. And there's lots of studies and even pilots going on in other cities in North America showing just greater outcomes. So it's not defunding. It's about ensuring we are funding appropriately to get the right expertise at the doors and freeing up the police to do what they do best to address crisis, right, SWAT kind of things. But right now they're being called to answer everything. And that is not an effective use of resources. So that as mayor is what I want to champion and also ensure we've actually are supporting our first responders. They also are suffering terribly, right? Fatigue, um, just burnout, what they've had to deal with during COVID uh, and making sure that they also are getting supports that because at the, at the end of the day, this is about us all being human and knowing how we to regulate our emotions from little ones to adults. And there are lots of ways and skill building around to do that because anger is just a response to fear. And we have to start talking in that form. I'm, I'm going to ask a question and I apologize if it comes off yeah. uh, insincere, but I am a white person. You are white as well. Yes. Uh, the majority of people who are saying defund the police are of not white descent. They are pe uh, black people, indigenous people of color. They are feeling that they are being... Uh, stereotype they are be, feel like they I, i'm not trying to speak for them but they don't feel safe in this community because they feel like the cops are the police force is actively looking at them and stereotyping them because they have a different color than white how do you address that how do you address racism and people we talk about feeling safe in the city if people can't walk down the street without being looked at because they have a different skin color than myself or yours that is another issue we need to address. How do you work with our uh, uh, BIPOC uh, uh, Calgarians to ensure that they do feel safe, that they feel like they don't have to look over their shoulder and get stereotyped just because they are of a different color? Yeah, and I'm, and I'm, I'm gonna actually get a little vulnerable here because sit, certainly sitting here as a white woman, uh, I thought that I, um, I'm going to say something, a belief that I had, that I've been tuned in, it's not correct, um, is I used to say that I didn't see color. Therefore, I was not racist. And when I say that, it means that I'm actually not acknowledging the experience of people that are racialized and marginalized. And that this is something I think we actually in our society and the systemic racism that is there, we have to come to appreciate 
that we actually have to see the actual barriers. And it also, this whole concept, I don't know if you've heard of it, Chris, intersectionality. So if you are female and black and right and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and gay, um, that adds many, many layers and all those other barriers. So we have to acknowledge that they face barriers that you and I would never even see. And we have to create space and we have to listen and we have to continue to counter that to ensure that they are actually being heard, being seen or given the opportunity. And it's a bit of almost stepping back to allow them to participate. Um, and so again, you know, a very vulnerable moment for me because I had to realize, oh my God, I'm racist because I bought into that narrative and it's not, I'm not seeing people for who they are. And, and so I'm a huge champion right now. And this is about going deep and really looking in the mirror and individually, us all coming to, uh, to terms with our own, what I'm gonna call unconscious biases. And what can we do to ensure that all of these perspectives that people actually are given a chance, which means this is the whole point about equity, not equality, it's equity. Because some people have far more barriers they have to overcome. And for those in positions of power and influence, what can we do to ensure that we actually do that? So that's how I feel about that. And I wanna be, and I am going to be that mayor because this is in my DNA, given all the work that I've done and I've worked overseas, I've worked in developing countries as well. Um, I don't wanna make, this may sound trite and I don't mean it to be, but I have been in situations where I have felt like the other and it is incredibly uncomfortable and fearful. And so part of that is I bring empathy to this and, I, and because, and this is one of the reasons I wanna step up and say enough, it, and we have to stop these behaviors, but we also have to understand the root cause of it, which is about systemic racism. And so much of these behaviors when people are lashing out is out of fear. And how do we address that? We have to acknowledge that and get people to support things. I, I, I very much I appreciate you taking- no, I get I, on my soapbox about this. I appreciate you taking the time to answer that question because I feel like that isn't addressed a lot. And the moment that you were really willing to answer that question, I appreciate it. And I, I, I give you credence that you're willing to talk about it so openly and so vulnerably. So thank you so much, Jen. Um, I want to go back to a topic that you talked about briefly, but injection sites. Uh, the province has looked at the injection safe injection site down in downtown Calgary. And if I'm not mistaken, is uh, slated to close or has closed already. Um, you are in. You are pro uh, injection sites, as Jesus said. You talk to the Calgarians, and they will say, I, "I am pro as well, just not in my backyard. I don't want it in my backyard. I don't want it in my in my neighborhood. Put it downtown. Put it somewhere I don't need to see it." So, how do you how do you get people to come on board and say, "Yes, we need it," and yes, someone is going to have to take this site, and we're going to have to put it in a neighborhood. It may not be the most. Uh, want it thing, but we need it for the safety and well-being of all of for the citizens who need access to it. Yeah, because it saves lives and the research is very clear. Um, and part of that, I think, is again back to we talked a little bit about trauma, right? And people actually, you know, using drugs to actually, it's a coping mechanism, right? To actually deal with the pain. I think we need to all kind of come to that basic human acknowledgement of that. And where I think we've gone amiss on safe and the site even safe injection sites, we've not been openly transparent about them, what it's going to mean. We've also not added the community resources uh, to ensure that people actually have places to go when they are concerned, and also that there are supports for the clients of these safe injection sites that actually support them and help manage all of that within the neighborhood. I think uh, they were just cited and put there. This is the best place from a medical reason to do that. Uh, and not appreciating working with community. And this is something that I think we've got to do better, have a bit of experience with this when we cited the new YWCA hub in a neighborhood in Inglewood. And we had to get out in front and, and so that people understood, right? The circumstances about, uh, and people want typically to help women, but when they start to face the reality of that, well, that means that other, their friends are gonna to come to that site. Well, maybe I don't like that, so I don't like it anymore. We have to kind of build this awareness of understanding how we support as a community, but it's about also ensuring that that site has the community resources, particularly in safe injection sites with dope teams. We didn't really resource also the organizations to provide that sort of additional support. Things ironically, when you talk to some of the neighbors are working better now, and now we're gonna close it. 
because they actually worked out some of these kinks, what we're not doing a great job of because we get caught in this, well, healthcare is provincial, so that's not my backyard in the city. So we're just gonna let them do, or just let us do that. We know what we're doing. We have to collaborate more strongly, much like the conversation you and I just had about the police, getting the strong partnerships and getting the right expertise at the table, at the grassroots, on the ground that actually can support uh, these sorts of facilities. That's where we've fallen down. Um, and uh, I know the players who can actually help fix this. And if we don't address it, people are going to die. They're already dying. And we're seeing increases in opioid crisis and uh, deaths and overdoses. This is also the natural, this shadow pandemic that I've talked about. So yeah. we have to get a grip on this. We've got to make sure that we've got the resources in place. Um, I want to. I'm just cautious of time here, and I get again. I love yeah, talking we policy. Can go on I forever about this stuff. Yeah, I love. This is why I love these interviews because I love talking policy with people who potentially are going to be running this city. Um, I want to talk about infrastructure right now, and two of the biggest infrastructure projects that are going to be on the on the uh, the plate for the next council is the Green Line, making sure that it runs smoothly and gets uh, actually shovel in the ground. I know the Prime Minister says by fall we're going to have it in the uh, shovels in the ground. I think a lot of Calgarians are just like, okay, when I see the shovel in the ground, I will actually believe that it's actually happening. And the arena deal. I'm going to start with the green line first. The proposed line goes up to 16th Avenue and it does not go north, which a lot of the people in the north want. How do you envision working towards getting that green line up north? Because we need to act, uh, people need to access transit and we need to get it up there. So, um, so I have built large infrastructure projects and on teams that have built large infrastructure projects on time, on budget, most recently no debt with the YWCA hub, but also in my pipeline days, I've built pipeline infrastructure. And so we've got to make sure too that we deliver on these projects, spending our dollars wisely. And, and I think sometimes what is missed in the public discourse is not understanding that scope can change in these large projects. This is actually, I know a lot of citizens have grave concerns. So you've got to make sure you're managing the risk of that and that you have the governance and the checks and balances as you start to execute on these projects that you can actually stop and alter course as you learn new things. And that means things will change, but you've got to make sure that you're working within the confines of the budget envelope that we've set for the project. I'm on record, Chris, of being very pro going north. When I look at sort of the ridership and looking at what we need to do, uh, we need to go north. And so committed to doing that. I also think because of how important public transit is, not only in connecting our city, giving our citizens, particularly people we want to attract, you and I've already talked about that today, that they have transportation options. If they're going to live downtown, they don't need a car. Uh, so we've got to have a robust and reliable public transit system. Um, and, and we've got to make sure that we've got it, it is designed for ridership. So we've got to make sure we're looking at that. But there is going to be also, it's critical in managing our carbon liability. With carbon levies over the next 20 years, this city is facing at 1.8 collectively, that's citizens, businesses, and also the operations of the city, a $1.8 billion tax liability. Public transit helps us address and remove that because it gets cars off the street and it reduces emissions. And so what I want to make sure, and that's another reason to go north, when we look at the increased ridership and making it easy to get around this town and how we connect. So I want to make sure that we're using these capital dollars. And I also believe because we're actually are addressing climate change at the same time, there is going to be more funding if we can prove that we can execute on the existing scope. Firmly see that, because this is in the national interest. So I want to be that mayor that's able to leverage those dollars from all levels of government to do that in service of our citizens. Um, one of the other areas, the another infrastructure project that you're going to have to deal with is the arena this week. Council, yeah. if I'm not actually, as we were recording this, because this is going to be coming out in September, uh, this week, uh, council voted for the arena deal with a potential of new money that has to go into the arena from the city and the flames as well. Um, this has been a thorn in a lot of people's sides because we don't want more money going to it. Now we're putting more money into it. Now we're having a smaller arena compared to what with the Saddle Dome. How do you how do you look at this and say, okay, we need the uh, the event center, but we also need to ensure that it's not costing the tax dollars taxpayers yeah. any more money. 
Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's similar, right, back to, again, my experience in getting infrastructure projects done. I think, um, again, the problem with conversation, we have to appreciate that these projects do change as you learn things and as you go out to market and cost things out. And you have to have a robust process where you actually trade off, right? Um, and so we're seeing that. Um, you also, from a risk perspective of going over budget, given what you thought you were going to do, it is always great to have many parties at the state that actually protects the public interest. So the deal is a good one that we've landed and we've actually minimized uh, what the city is on the hook for in terms of cost overruns, particularly with scope changes. What is also uh, what we've protected in this project, which I firmly believe in terms of my revitalization plan for downtown core, we need world-class facilities that attract events and people. In addition to you know hockey sport, which pulls people together, vibrant streetscape. It's about investing in that entertainment district. I've been uh, enamored with what they've been doing down in Austin. You know, you look at Nashville, you look at Boulder and other things. Um, we can be that music center. And that's been the vision for the National Music Center, which is right across the street, right, where this entertainment center is going to be or this new arena is going to be. You think about that ability to pull people together and be something we're incredibly proud about, bring the pool back to Calgary. This is all part of that vision because it's just not about the flame, but we have a group and other businesses that are willing to help us fund this major infrastructure that is going to create economy and local economy for the next decades forward. So I am pro this sort of project, but I'm also um, very keen and astute because it is council, this new council's job is to deliver and get these projects done. And I'm just gonna offer, I'm the only candidate who's actually delivered on infrastructure projects. I know how to do this. I know what questions to ask. And that's the leadership we need going forward. Now to my view, uh, to my viewers and to my listeners, uh, if as we are moving into the next section of the uh, pod, uh, the episode, uh, if we have not talked about an issue that you want to address or want Jan to address, please visit our website, uh, jandamory.com. The links will be in the show notes. So please reach out because we need to be informed. Uh, Jan, I want you to put your uh, time machine, uh, jump in the time machine, put yourself on October 19th. You were the uh, mayor designate for the city of Calgary. Priority number one is what? Building a high performing team for city council. Because we and have What does not that look like for you? So already doing the work on that. Actually, Chris, it's building, right? The very specific ideas, building relationships with councillors, understanding what's important. We will just come off an election. We'll have a very clear, uh, you know, sort of indication what people are caring about and that we actually get an agreement that we're going to work together. And that's the role of the mayor to facilitate that. Um, so, and so what you're going to see is that people are going to start to see, right? Oh, we don't have the divisiveness. We don't have the grandstanding that has been going on. That behavior will be eliminated. Any good politician, any good candidate puts in metrics for themselves if elected. If elected, I want in year one, I want this, 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 and this done. And I will have a successful first year in office if they, I can go back to the people and say, I've accomplished that. What are the metrics yeah. that you're putting in place for yourself to ensure that you do have a successful first year? And I'm not saying first term, but first year, because that is the most important year. year. Yeah, and it's, and it's about, are we seeing those sort of milestones to create 80,000 new jobs, which is what we're, my platform is talking about. Are we actually seeing movement on these projects, including that rail project and that BMO convention center that makes Calgary the destination? Are we actually starting to see more people living downtown? Are we seeing an optimism in the people, right? We're starting to get more opportunities and people are actually seeing, hey, I wanna be a part of this. I wanna be a part of this story. We're seeing people actually come out of their homes and congregating in public spaces because of what we are attracting in the events. And, uh, uh, and it's about also that we're seeing people really um, supporting, right? Our local restaurants and the artists are out there. There's a vibrancy and a vibe, a vibe that is happening. So those are the very specific milestones and that people are not carrying bear spray. Or pepper spray with the new proposal or change. Spray. Well, I came out very strongly on that. Like how ludicrous is that? Oh, I agree. I yeah. don't know what, what they were thinking on that one, but we could talk about the provincial government for another four hours if we wanted to as well. Um, my last question for you before we do the wrap up here is, 
take two minutes, talk to the people who are listening, talk to the people who are watching. Why should you be the next count uh, next counselor? Why should you be the next mayor for the city of Calgary? Yeah. Um, it's about leadership. This is, this is a really important um, a time in our city uh, because of also the big changeover in council. Um, we need strong leadership also to deliver on all of the plans that are now in action. And so I really encourage you not to vote by name recognition, but to do your research and look at the background and the track record of the candidates that actually are entering this race. And I admire anyone who's willing to put their hat into the public arena. But I hope that you will find in my record that I have the diversity of experience and I have led complex organizations. I am the one that is offering the leadership that can actually drive us forward and create this beacon in this city that we become and generate new jobs. We become the destination globally and that we create and restore the heart and soul of this city. And so that everyone is included in recovery and people feel safe, seen and heard. That is what you are investing by voting for me as mayor of that city. That's the vision. So thank you. And I look forward to earning your support. Now, in order to earn your support, you need to get to as many doors as possible. You need people yes. to reach out, to learn about you. How can people learn about you? How can they learn more about Jan Damery so that way they can be informed about that decision that they're making on October 18th? Yeah, so the first place is go to the website. You can see sort of very detailed platform and it's get involved. Uh, we are building an army of volunteers. They're helping us door knocking, bringing people together at, campaign, at the campaign office. Get involved in the process. Get a sign on your lawn. I'm going to get you yours, Chris. So I've made a note of that. Uh, be visible. Talk to your friends and family. This is so critical. I think um, people typically have sort of ignored until the last minute municipal politics. But never more than ever is local politics and our city's future more important. We have to all engage in this process and ensure you are getting the right leadership. It falls on all of us as voters to do that. Get active, get informed. And we are building a very big tent on my campaign. So get involved in the campaign. I'd love to see and meet you and let's have a conversation. For my listeners and to my viewers, the links to Jan's uh, social media accounts, her email, her website will be in the show notes. Please, 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 please. please and that's why I'm doing this show right now. Learn, go out. Educate yourself on who you're going to be voting for, because this is the future of our city we're talking about. The future of our city and the future, the next four years are going to be the most crucial four years in our city's history. So please get out, get involved, and learn about the candidates. Thank you, Jan, for doing this. This has been a wonderful, like I said, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been so fun.